Good afternoon. Glad to see you all here. We appreciate your attendance this afternoon. Uh, my name is William Hubbard. I'm from Columbia, South Carolina, and I have the privilege of serving this year as president of the American Bar Association. Welcome to today's special Law Day program, The Great Charter, What Makes Magna Carta Mythic. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in the heart of our nation's capital. Uh, this year marks the 15th annual edition of the Leon Jaworski Public Program to commemorate Law Day. And it's also the sixth successive year that we've conducted uh, this lecture at the Wilson Center. And we are so pleased to have the Wilson Center as our host and program partner. Uh, it's been a great partnership and we look forward to continuing that partnership for many years. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Blair Rubel, Vice President for Programs of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you, William, and welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I want to um, welcome you on behalf of the Wilson Center's President, Jane Harmon, and all my colleagues. We're very pleased that you're here. If you've been here before, we'd like to welcome you back. Uh, and if you haven't been here before, uh, we hope that you'll return to hear our programming on many subjects uh, in the future. As many of you probably already know, Woodrow Wilson is the only American president to have a PhD. And the center was established in 1968 to memorialize him by bringing together the world of ideas and world of public affairs. And we do so through many means, including uh, meetings like this. And it's wonderful to have uh, such great partners as uh, the ABA and, and this program in particular. Uh, I also want to join those of you who are, who are in, in a sense, in the room, but virtually uh, by the live webcast at wilsoncenter.org. Jane Harmon asked me to extend a special warm welcome to Stephen Breyer, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, and to thank Justice Breyer for, for honoring us with your participation in this program. Uh, Jane was particularly outspoken about this because I, I gather you're old friends and she wanted to be sure that we made one of her old friends feel welcome here at the center. So, welcome. As William mentioned, this is the sixth consecutive year that the Jaworski Law Day program has been conducted here at the Wilson Center. It's a great honor for us and it's a pleasure to collaborate with the American Bar Association uh, in presenting what has been really very top quality uh, programs uh, over the past six years. And tonight's discussion, I think, is a special one uh, because uh, here we are at the 800th anniversary of the signing of the Magna Carta, a, a document which has attained mythic status, uh, a, a mythic status which has made it foundational uh, in many ways to uh, liberal democracies around the world. Uh, to um, the concept of, of the rule of law. And uh, I think it's very important for us to mark this anniversary and to explore the ways in which the Magna Carta is still uh, with us uh, today and, and really with all liberal democracies. So I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you. Rubel, thank you very much for those, uh, those words and your kind hospitality. This time, I would like to introduce uh, Stephen Curley, who is so ably chairing 2015 Law Day for the American Bar Association and our nation. Thank you, William. As the ABA's 2015 National Law Day chair, I'm honored to serve on the Standing Committee on Public Education. The Standing Committee has planned and organized this program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the great American lawyer, Leon Jaworski, for whom this program is named. Of course, he's famous for his role in the Watergate scandal. He was appointed as the second Watergate special prosecutor after the Saturday Night Massacre of October 20th, 1973. But just two years before that, he was the president of the ABA. And while president, he established the special committee that has developed into the ABA Division for Public Education. The bequest from his estate in 1983 
established an endowed ABA fund in his name, and this endowment continues to support annual ABA programs such as this one, which are dedicated to advancing public education and understanding of the law and its role in society. The ABA has been honored to partner with the Wilson Center in conducting this 2015 Leon Jaworski Public Program, and we're delighted to work not only with the Wilson Center, but also with the Federation of State Humanities Councils, whose president, Esther McIntosh, I believe is with us today. Thank you, Esther. I'd like to thank those organizations for their long-term support of the program. Now, since 1958, Law Day has been our annual opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to the rule of law. It is celebrated by bar associations, courts, schools, community groups all over our country. They organize programs for young people and adults to increase their understanding of the principle of the rule of law and law's essential role in American society. The ABA provides leadership and resources to assist these efforts, and this is one of those programs. So thank you very much, and enjoy the program. Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say just a few words about this year's Law Day theme, which commemorates Magna Carta and its connection to this Jaworski program. Uh, in commemorating Magna Carta's 800th anniversary, we are marking the iconic text that we now regard as the foundational symbol of law and liberty. Magna Carta has come to represent the principle of the rule of law, that no ruler is above the law, and that those who govern are accountable to the governed. That first version of what became known as the Great Charter of Liberty emerged from a June 15, 1215 meeting on a watery meadow of Runnymede near Windsor Castle in England. Uh, in 1957, the American Bar Association erected a memorial to Magna Carta on that very meadow and inscri inscribed on a granite pillar in the middle of the memorial are precisely the words of this year's Law Day theme, Magna Carta, symbol of freedom under law. Magna Carta and Runnymede are indeed very special to the ABA and indeed to all of the organized bar. The 1215 Leon Jaworski public program will explore what makes Magna Carta mythic, delving into the mythic and iconic qualities of the Great Charter can help us better understand an eight-century-long legal political tradition, why it has endured and its continuing significance today. I'm so pleased that this year's Leon Jaworski Public Program commemorates Law Day 12, 2015 and the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. To help us mark this very special occasion, I am honored to welcome and introduce the Honorable Stephen G. Breyer, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. In addition to his crucial duties on the court, Justice Breyer gives so much of his time, energy, expertise, and leadership to educating the public, improving our justice system, and energizing all of us to be better citizens. Justice Breyer is taking time out of a very busy time for the court, as you all know. It's a very demanding time. So we're very honored, most honored, by his presence with us this afternoon. Justice Breyer. Thank you. I, I, I love to go to ABA meetings. Uh, no, Bob Meserve explained that to me. He was former president of the ABA years and years ago. He said lawyers love meetings. And there's no place better than the ABA with its 300,000 members and 800,000 committees. Now, actually, it's true. It, it's in those committees that the work of the law gets done quite a lot, quite a lot. And that's part of what I think is a really good question. Why has the Magna Carta attained a mythic status? And I think more mythic, that's what we were discussing a few minutes ago, maybe more mythic in the United States, maybe more status in the United States than in England. We at the court uh, refer to it quite a lot. Compared, I suspect, to the Law Committee of the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court of England. It would be interesting to check that. So why is it so important to us? I think these are the words uh, that, are, that are particularly important in Clause, what is it, 39. No free man shall be arrested or imprisoned or disseized. My property professor, A.J. Kasner, would have liked that word. 
<laughs> and then take the private life estate away for something like that. Or outlawed, or exiled, or in any way victimized. Uh, neither will we attack him or send anyone to attack him. I'm glad to hear that. Except by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. That's it, the law of the land. That's what resonates. Now, why does it resonate so much? Now, I suspect, and this is a theory, the whole panel's there. They know a lot about the Magna Carta. I don't. You will hear a lot of experts on this, and so you will get really a more accurate answer. Uh, but I think part of the answer, growing out of my own experience on the court, part of the answer is this. If you ask an American to think about, think about the question, who are you? Who are we as a people? Now, a Brit will probably think somewhere in his, or used to think anyway, we are the descendants of King Arthur, or if not King Arthur, the Angles and the Saxons, if not them, at least William the Conqueror, etc. Uh, a Frenchman will think, well, it's uh, uh, something to do with Pepin the Short or Clovis the Great or whoever it was. And, and, and it was tribes that, 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 you know, that ran through Europe and most of the world. That wasn't us. So who are we? Now, I think part of our identity as Americans, we can be traced back to what the founders were doing. Well, what were they doing? Well, uh, two parts to that. They thought of themselves as creating, I believe, an experiment. An experiment in what? Well, the line that made its author immortal, and properly so, was the single sentence that catches the nature of the experiment, which was Jefferson's. We hold these truths, we all memorized it, to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. It, that's why it's immortal, that line. It captures what they were trying to do in the Declaration, in the Revolution, and then later in the Constitution. Now, jump forward 80 years or so, and think of the other thing we all had to memorize, or used to have to memorize as students, uh, which was the Gettysburg Address. And the question sometimes we want to ask Lincoln is, why did you say this? You said that if you could keep the nation together without freeing the slaves, you would do it. Half slave, half free, you'd do it. All free, you'd do it. Do you really mean that? Wasn't it about slavery? No, he says. Not entirely. At least not entirely. Well, what's in his mind? Is he being insincere about that? Is that just a political statement? I think maybe he was being sincere. And insofar as he was, the first sentence and second sentence of the Gettysburg Address captures an idea. He says, um, um, four score and seven years ago. Good question to ask your children, grandchildren. Why four score and seven? It's not, it's not the Constitution. What happened four score and seven years ago? It's the Declaration of Independence. Why that, not the Constitution? Because the Constitution said nothing good about, sla about uh, 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 freeing the slaves. Because the Constitution said nothing about the key sentence in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. That's the phrase, and he wants that phrase. So he says, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. You see? We are in the midst of a great war fought to determine whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We say those words without thinking about them. Now think about them. The framers wondered, we are an experiment. There is no other nation that encapsulates those Jeffersonian words. The rest of them, they're all monarchies. They're people, you know, go look at Cromwell and uh, this television thing, you know. Henry VIII, I mean, you know, or Henry IV, Part I, or whoever was running the country. You know, there, I mean, my goodness, my goodness. I mean, no one else. And we don't know if it'll work. Say, an experiment. And Lincoln is saying, what's important, just as much as slavery, all men are created equal, is can that experiment endure? 
and in 1865, no one knows. No one knows. But it's important to keep the nation together, not just for geographical reasons, but to prove to a skeptical world that Jefferson's statement about how you can run a government can work. That's called the experiment. And do we think we proved it works? No, I don't think we have. We proved it sort of works up to this point. That's what we proved. Do we prove the experiment stops? No, of course not. We prove we are in the midst of the same experiment. And that's what I think is at least part of the answer to the question, who are you Americans? Who are you as Americans? And the answer in part is, we are the people who are still engaged in that experiment. And that's why people come into our court worshiping this document. It's more than the document. It is part of who we are. It is part of what keeps us together. Government, that rule of law, is part of what it means to be part of this country in a way, though it's terribly important in other countries too, not quite like it's important for us because we are 310 million people of everybody under the sun. You see? We need it. Now, what are those words, rule of law, that we say have achieved mythic proportions? Well, we know what they're not. I mean, everyone knows what they're not. They're not the, this, the opposite. The opposite is arbitrary. See, Tommy Sussman and I and a lot of others here were all involved in administrative law. And the, the 14 people who really know administrative law love it. All right? So that's why there's an administrative law section in the ABA, right? So, so, so in any case, we, we, we like it. All right? So uh, uh, be, being in, in, in involved in that, uh, what we like in this uh, document, the Administrative Procedure Act, is you can set aside an act of government if it is arbitrary, capricious, abuse of discretion. What is arbitrary, capricious, abuse of discretion? It's in the same category as King John running in and taking people he doesn't like and putting them in the tower or wherever he put them without a trial. It's the opposite of a rule of law. And so what we're working for is the opposite of the arbitrary, capricious, abusive discretion, despotic, autocratic, tyrannical, you name it. That's what we understand it. That's what we're against. And it's those words that draw us back to the Magna Carta. Now, why do I say we're still in the midst of this experiment? Because I get questions often, my goodness, twice today. Because I got a couple of visitors, from San, one from a couple from San Francisco. So, and I, I, same thing. Same thing, but the way this question was put the best, I think, and I've said this 4,000 times, but I'm no point, no harm in saying it again. <laughs> the, 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 the question I liked the best was the, the, the uh, president of the Supreme Court of Ghana. All right, Ghana's having a tough time. She's trying to make it more democratic and more respectful of individual human rights. Great, I liked her very much, very good good staff, she was over there. And, and I get the same question from her, I get the same question from people from Burkina Faso, from people from Asia, from people South America. And when they get down to it, what the question is, is why in heaven's name do people do what you say? A court. Why do they do it? I mean, we're nine judges. Hey, you could have 90, you could have 9,000, you have 900,000, there are 310 million people. And contrary to popular belief of those 310 million, you know, 309 million are not judges and they're not lawyers. Right. But they'll do it. And she says, why? I said, the truthful answer to this document is, of course, a great document. I mean, it, it embodies basic principles. It uh, 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 insists upon, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dem democratic system for creating laws, a certain kind of democracy, a democracy that protects individual rights, that's the amendments there for the most part, that divides power horizontally and vertically, states federal and three branches of government, so no group of government people can become too powerful, that's the idea, uh, that assures a certain degree of uh, equality that it started out not doing, but now it does, and uh, uh, that insists upon a, uh, a rule of law. So when there are five principles there, you see. But that, that's what it is, and I tend to think of, and I think my colleagues do, too, too. The rest are sort of details. All right, but, but why do they do it? Because after all, and then I, I can say there's no answer to that. The answer lies in custom. The answer lies in habit. The answer lies in a long history. And we've had not so great a history sometimes. I mean, I say we did have our ups and downs. 
And I tell them a story, I always tell it in terms of rule of law is a good story. It was when Andrew Jackson, after the Supreme Court said that Northern Georgia belongs to the Cherokees, he said John Marshall made his decision, now let him enforce it. And he sent troops to Georgia, but not to help the Cherokees or to enforce the rule of law. He sent them all to Oklahoma along a trail of tears where they died. And I tell them, which is a good story, and it's good, not just more than a story. It is when, what I think is a great moment, and I wish if they have this Eisenhower Memorial, they put this in it, is when Eisenhower, uh, uh, when Governor Faubus stood in the door in Little Rock, as many of us remember, some of us anyway, and uh, said, those black children are not going to enter this school. And uh, he was advised then that, uh, I don't know what you're going to do exactly about this. Jimmy Burns told him that, former member of our court former governor of uh, uh, South Carolina, a moderate on race, he said, Mr. President, if you send troops down there, you better be prepared for a second reconstruction. He said, you will, you will, you will uh, not be able to do it. They won't pay any attention. You see what happened. But, but uh, the Attorney General, Brownell, told him, do it. And the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the 101st Airborne, and everybody knew the 101st Airborne, uh, uh, at, those, at that time, they were the people who had been parachuted into uh, Normandy and they got hung up on the spires and they were shot down. They were the heroes there of Normandy, the Battle of the Bulge. A thousand of them are in the airplane. They fly off at Eisenhower's direction to Little Rock and they escort those children, those black children, very brave, uh, into that white school. No, that wasn't the end. We all know that wasn't the end. That wasn't even hardly the beginning. But it, I, and that's the point I want to stress. Thank goodness he did that. But if he hadn't done it, uh, who knows? But he did do it, and it's still. They closed the school later on. They then had to reopen it. And it took Martin Luther King and the Freedom Riders, and it took all kinds of people all over the country who were not lawyers, who were not judges, and they had to come along before we got anywhere in bringing what the Constitution seemed directly to say, equal protection of the law uh, to people in the South. And then I, that's what I said this morning to my two visitors. I said, I heard, I heard a Senator Reid say the most remarkable thing about Bush v. Gore is something that is very rarely remarked. And that is despite the fact, and there are quite a few cases like this, an important case. Yeah, I think it was. And unpopular, at least with half the people, maybe a few more than half. But nonetheless, <laughs> it was, it was, it was. It was, it was an unpopular decision in many quarters. And in my view, I wrote a dissent. I thought it was completely wrong. Now, we're, we're not a lot 5-4, but we are about 20% of the time. And, and if we are, somebody's wrong. You know, judges aren't, aren't always right. I don't tell anyone I said that, but, 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 but you understand the point. And so you have to bring people to the point where they will accept the rule of law, meaning something affects them, it's very unpopular with them, and yet they think it's wrong. And they may be right in thinking it's wrong, but they'll follow it. So that's a remarkable thing. That is a treasure. And so when I say this to Stanford or Berkeley or some other place, I add something. I say, I know about 20% of you think it's too bad there weren't a few riots after Bush v. Gore. And I say, that's a tempting thought. But before you conclude that that's right, you turn on the television set, and you see how in a lot of countries, uh, people decide to resolve their major differences. Ask yourself, is that what you want? Of course not. And uh, that's a worthwhile exercise. Okay, so that is coming after nearly 200 years, including uh, slavery, including 80 years of legal segregation, including a civil war, including all kinds of things. Whereas at that point, sort of, no guarantees, no guarantees. And that's why I say the experiment continues, and it does. So what can we do about that? I tell the president of the Ghana court, go, my only thing I can suggest is you've got this yourself. Don't, don't just talk to the judges and the lawyers. I mean, they agree with you, of course. It's the villages that count. Get those judges and get those lawyers to go out to those villages or go out to the cities and get the person who isn't the judge or the lawyer to understand the importance for them of having that kind of system. And that's the rule of law. Passing this on. Passing it on to our children, to our grandchildren, and that's words, but it better be deeds.
And that's why Sandra O'Connor goes around the country saying this. And that's why you get people all over in public life of both parties. The one thing they think is, that, well, yeah, pass it on, the system. To the next generation, to the generation after that. All right, so that is a reason. There we are. I've concluded. The reason is, that's one reason why, indeed, this uh, Magna Carta, with those words, have correctly achieved a uh, mythic status. And it's also a reason why you're having this kind of meeting. And all I can say is the more of these kinds of meetings you have and the more that you go out and the more you bring those people who aren't the lawyers or judges into it and explain to them on law day and other days too, if you'd like, the better. Thank you. I simply don't, I simply don't think it's possible for anybody to do as well as what Justice Breyer does, and that's give an explication of American history, the rule of law, Magna Carta, judicial review, separation of powers, in a lively way in 20 minutes. Uh, we're, we're, indebted, we're indebted to him for not only his service on the court, but again, all the energy and effort that he puts into uh, enlightening us at every juncture in, in, in his own uh, inspiring way. So with that, um, we will now turn the program over to John Maluski. Uh, he's Director of Digital Programming for the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He serves as Executive Producer, Host, and Managing Editor for Context, uh, the Wilson Center, Wilson Center Now and other programs. Uh, he's a veteran broadcast journalist and communications professional with extensive experience as a moderator, interviewer, anchor, reporter, and producer. John is a frequent moderator for the Leon Jaworski series and other public programs and panel discussions of the American Bar Association Division for Public Education. I'm now pleased to turn the program over to John. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Some of the things in my resume aren't true, but we needed to pad to give time for, so I apologize for that. But and I'd like to withdraw the resume joke since it went over like a ton of uh, bricks. <laughs> well, that was quite a, a thrill to hear Justice Breyer. What a lively presentation. What a great way to start things off. And we promise no drop off. If there's one thing I've learned as I, I've been moderating, I think Howard and I were talking about this that uh, since Law Day has been in existence now, uh, I think I now have moderated more than half of the Jaworski programs. And the one thing that is consistent. The topics change, the locales change, things change, but the excellence of the panel that is assembled remains outstanding. And so for a moderator, that's great fun because this job is largely about who you get to ask questions of. And so what I'll do is I'll begin by introducing the panelists to you in the brief format. You have programs that provide their more extensive uh, biographies. Uh, impressive biographies. I'll just give you name, rank, serial number from your left to right so you know who you're talking to. We'll have a discussion up here, and then we'll turn to you for your questions and comments, preferably questions and focused questions, but you know, we'll, we'll endure a little bit of speechifying as well. So uh, from uh, your left to right, joining us is Akil Reed Amar, Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University. Also H. Robert Baker, an Associate Professor of History at Georgia State University. Daniel Barstow McGraw is a prof professorial lecturer for Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Drizzly Malcolm is Patrick Henry Professor of Constitutional Law and the Second Amendment at George Mason University School of Law. And finally, Kenton Worcester is a Professor of Political Science at Marymount Manhattan uh, College. Please welcome the panel to the discussion. <laughs> so here's, how, here's what I you know, have in mind for the opening. I hope you won't find this too whimsical. But we're going to play a game of word association. I'll give you a word, a term. And you think of one word or phrase that first comes to mind. And uh, we have judges. We will seal your responses. <laughs> in, uh, no, that's not true. I had 800 years to come up with this. It's the best I could do. OK, so <laughs> Magna Carta, surprise, is the term. Magna Carta. So let's go through in the order of introduction. And if, if just, you know, not a professorial <laughs> analytical response, just the first thing that pops into your mind when you think Magna Carta. Let's begin with you, Akhil. Um, myth. And, I, and, I, and, and not I'm not ick. Myth. Ick or myth? No, no, they're not interchangeable. Myth. Okay, Rob. Fish weirs. 
Daniel? Since myth is taken, I would say constitutionalism. Constitutionalism, okay. Joyce? Control of the executive. Control of the executive, okay. And finally, Kent? I don't have a good one. History and politics. It's not a bad one. A little pedestrian, let's admit it, but no. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so let's, well, in reverse order, let's begin with why is that the first thing? Ex we'll have you now expand on the, the association that you had. <clears throat> Almost everything we think we know about the Magna Carta is wrong. Huh. It wasn't finalized on June 15th. It was finalized four days later. It was never signed by King John. It was stamped, of course, with his seal. It was not originally divided into 63 articles. It's, of course, not the Magna Carta because Magna includes the word the. Uh, and I think more importantly, it's not the oldest English law by a long shot. Uh, English law begins in uh, the early 7th century, the so-called Kentish laws, which are uh, marvelous. So you have around 700 years of English law before you have the Magna Carta, much of which helped shape the Magna Carta. It wasn't translated into English until about a century after its drafting. It was translated into French first, quel horreur. And um, <laughs> it's a charter of liberties, but it's not quite a charter of individual liberty. It's uh, much more about what the medieval mind regarded as corporate groups, foreigners, merchants, nobles, freemen. I hope we talk about the freemen part because I think that's possibly the most interesting aspect of the entire charter. Uh, so it wasn't democratic, but it was consultative. It did place authority under law. And I think for the key thing, and I think this helps explain Justice Breyer's point about its popularity for Americans, the key thing is that it defends a, uh, an idea, a political idea, which Americans take for granted, I think, and which many people influenced more by Roman law regard as almost exotic or unworkable, which is the, the Magna Carta starts not with individual freedom, uh, not with democracy, but with multiple power centers. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, once you say multiple power centers, the relevance of that for the American system is, I think, self-evident. Thanks. Okay. Joyce, uh, you're next. Yes. Um, I'm a historian, so I um, admit that, uh, that there were ancient laws before Magna Carta. Magna Carta was really meant to preserve and protect the laws that, and rights that were already on the books. Um, although you can see it as power centers, because it starts out, the Church of England shall be free. Um, it, um, by the time the, of the American founding, and even before, the English people always believed that they were freeborn Englishmen. That was, they prided themselves on that. And that was something that the, that the Americans inherited. Um, the king signed it under duress, which uh, all lawyers would know that could easily be appealed. He appealed to the pope, <laughs> who uh, said that anybody who uh, enforced Magna Carta was excommunicated. Um, but fortunately, John died not long afterwards, and um, his, the child who succeeded him um, was under the rule of barons, really, of regents. Um, I think that what it really does is that it makes the power center, the king, promise to abide by a whole series of uh, particular rights of groups, particular rights of individuals, and although there obviously were ups and downs in the course of actually trying to force the executive to do that, um, it was the reconfirmed by king after king after king after king and recited to the public twice a year, and most of whom presumably were illiterate, so that they would have a sense of it. So I think that, that to me the major thing is that it's an attempt to really control those who govern um, to make sure that they have to protect the rights of individuals. Mm -hmm. Daniel. Constitutionalism, because the, the one principle, the one thing that Magna Carta originally stood for that has lasted all these centuries is the notion that uh, everyone is subject to the law and that that can be established by a written document. And that is still the case. That's the idea of a constitution. Um, I'd, I'd like just to comment a, a little on what Kenton said because uh, when he says everything we think about Magna Carta is wrong, I think we have to think who's we and which Magna Carta. The, the word myth came up. 
Um, I think what we think about the myth of Magna Carta is actually right, <coughs> because it is a myth. And that's what's had the impact since the 17th century is this myth. Uh, we routinely ignore things from the original Magna Carta. Uh, it it um, recognized feudalism. It only applies to half the people in England, not to everyone. Uh, it has an anti-Semitic provision, chapter 10. Uh, it recognizes trial by battle in chapter 54. Uh, we don't think about those things. We think about the myth, and I think what we think about the myth may be right, because it's the myth that we, that we think about. Um, Ross, just, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, just echoing that, we, we uh, routinely ignore things in Magna Carta, and we really ignore those fish weirs. Uh, it's my absolute favorite provision in Magna Carta because nobody has any clue what a fish weir is. <laughs> <laughs> and that you put across, well, okay, you do. Uh, but yeah. Some of us know what a fish cross. weir is, really. <laughs> I grew up in Arizona, so when I saw fish <laughs> weirs, I had no idea, and this was pre-Google days when I first looked at Magna Carta, and I couldn't find it. I had no idea. I was confused. I thought I will never study history again. Uh, and now I sit here 30 years later, actually really enjoying it. But the fish weirs uh, in Magna Carta really get you into the actual document. There, Magna Carta was about liberties, immunities, franchises, complaints that the barons, that the barons had against the king. It's about everything that, that uh, these panelists have mentioned. And I do think, actually, that the myth we make of it later is in some ways more important than the historical Magna Carta, and hopefully I'll talk about that later. Uh, but if you really want to look at the document, you can kind of notice some weird things in there, like the fact that they're concerned about putting fish nets up across the Thames. And one of the, the, one of the lessons that I extract from this is that if we want to understand historically rights struggles, and we can understand this as a rights struggle for you know, 30, 40 percent of the population maybe, uh, and, and if we want to think about it that way, then we can think about the fish weirs as being a, an intensely local issue that matters to these people. So there are things that matter, and they, they are represented in Magna Carta. Akil. Um, so I began with the word myth, and it's been echoed by some of uh, our colleagues. Um, um, so I'm uh, maybe the, uh, at this picnic the, the, the most skunk-like, uh, <laughs> because I'm, I'm probably the most skeptical that of of uh, really the <coughs> significance of Magna Carta for Americans today. That said, um, a very famous phrase from Magna Carta is the title of my book just out this month, The Law of the Land. So we, we borrow these phrases, but not in the same way, actually, that they were originally understood. Um, uh, we th later generations think, oh, well, um, uh, judgment of peers, that's about jury trial. But as you just heard, it's about trial by by battle and ordeal, and the Pope is, and the jury trial I is, is just um, emerging. The, the barons don't care about ordinary commoners sitting. Uh, 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 these, this, this is uh, 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 um, in, in judgment of, of, of other commoners. This is about barons and kings. It's about basically one unelected thug, um, strongmen, um, uh, uh, achieving a certain sort of compromise with other unelected strongmen. Um, you could call that the rule of law. Um, it, uh, it doesn't really, um, even in England today, you see they have these unelected monarchs um, and uh, government under law. Well, Parliament in, is seen in some ways as um, the, uh, uh, above the law and not quite below the law. Now, in the American tradition, that's not true. You see, our Constitution governs all the branches, even, the, even the, our Parliament. Um, so. Here's what I um, basically, uh, I want to endorse what my, my old boss, uh, Justice Breyer, said. He invoked the Declaration of Independence, and he invoked the Gettysburg Address, which is actually interesting. Left, um, uh, uh, this is my, my tie actually has the script of the Gettysburg Address right here. This is Mr. Lincoln. Here's what we should be talking about, um, at least as much as Magna Carta. That this month, April 2015, is the 240th anniversary of the shot heard around the world, Lexington and Concord, which will give us the Declaration of Independence and the idea of consent of the governed, you see, because no, the governed aren't voting for King John or Queen Elizabeth, for that matter, um, or the barons at running me. So 240 years we have, uh, ago, we, uh, we have the shot heard around the world. This month, consent of the governed. 150 years ago, this month, Mr. Lincoln is assassinated in this city 150 years ago after having been elected on an anti-slavery platform, re-elected 
um, uh, issued an emancipation, a Gettysburg Address and Emancipation Proclamation, re-elected on a promise to actually end slavery, having signed a 13th Amendment, not seeing it uh, implemented yet or even uh, adopted, that will end slavery um, in America, having in this city, in this month, 150 years, actually given a speech just four blocks from here saying black people should be allowed to vote. Now that's actually world transformative. Those, those things, consent of the governed, full freedom and equality, and Magna Carta, and they interpret Magna Carta for their purposes in all sorts of ways, um, and a new understanding of what the law of the land actually is all about, which is South Carolina can't take its land because it's our land. So Magna Carta, not so much. Quick thought, Daniel and Joyce both have. Yeah, quick, I, I don't think we need to choose, actually. These are all important, and they're extremely important. Um, I would pick up a, a note, uh, this idea of a multiple power centers. Uh, it is historically wrong that it was only the barons. I mean, the fish weirs demonstrates that. That was a concern of, of uh, business people, of fishermen. And there are many other elements in uh, the 1215 Magna Carta that, that aren't of concern to the barons per se. Uh, there are pr provisions protecting widows. Uh, there are provisions about forests uh, and the, the Dacronian uh, laws in the forests. There are any other, uh, we've already heard there are provisions about, about the Church of England uh, or the Catholic Church. Um, th this really was a civil society document in a way. It was the barons that forced it, but it was a much broader set of concerns. And uh, again, it's not, of course, consent of the government I governed in a, in a formalistic way, but in a real way, uh, th this was all of society. Knights, there were particular uh, provisions in there that the knights were concerned about, who are different, of course, than the barons. So it, it's a broader, a broader feel, and I, and I like this, uh, I forget who said it, I'm sorry, but the multiple uh, centers of power, I think, is a good way of thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, on, on the issue of the American Revolution, the shot heard around the world, what they were fighting for was their rights that they had as Englishmen, and which they felt, at least, uh, and, and were very wedded to the idea that uh, came from Magna Carta. The consent of the governed is in Magna Carta, it's the, or the vow from it. It's the notion that the king cannot pass a tax without calling his great council, and the great council becomes the parliament. And that is really what kept Magna Carta alive when there were other European nations that had great charters, but because the, the crown could pass taxes without calling the people together, mm -hmm. um, those other charters went by the way. So uh, consent of the governed really comes from Magna Carta. But by the way, I, I love the tie. I couldn't find, <laughs> a, couldn't find a Magna Carta tie, <laughs> but I'm wearing Magna Carta underoos. So <laughs> that, <laughs> Uh, Rob, you, had, you wanted to say, add to this part D of the discussion? Just, just a very short, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, line here, Magna Carta, not so much, uh, <laughs> which uh, I, I'll, I'll dispute on this ground. I, I have been doing some research on Magna Carta in the 19th century, and a quick scan of newspapers turned up 3,000 references to Magna Carta. Magna Carta is cited during the embargo crisis, during the War of 1812. It's cited again during the Missouri crisis. It's cited again by the Cherokee. It's cited repeatedly over and over again. It is absolutely central, and it's part, by the way, of a narrative, but it is central to Americans' identity in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. and, and this identity that they have actually reflects many of the themes that we have heard enunciated today. Rule of law, control of the executive. These things were central to their identity. They talk about how, how uh, from Magna Carta to the struggles with the Stuart, to the Petition of Right, to the Habeas Corpus Act, to the Bill of Rights, right to the American Revolution, you can draw this narrative line. Now, it's entirely myth. We know it's myth. But they believe, and they tell these stories repeatedly to themselves in order to emphasize the importance of these themes. In I, I'm sorry, Rob. I, I was just going to say, no, I, no, I, please I, finish. I, I, ju Justice Breyer started by telling stories. Yeah. And those stories were illustrative of these precise principles. Well, stories, myths, you know, when you. Here's a, a part of the readings that the ABA prepared in your program, The Power of Myth. Uh, uh, Alfred H. Knight writes, The disparity between the myth and fact of Magna Carta does not, of course, diminish it as a force in legal history. What is believed about it has taken on an independent life that does not depend upon historical verification. Now, I know historians may not like that, but I'm, I'm reminded of how Joseph Campbell defined a myth, that it may not be factually true, but it uh, 
reveals a greater truth than the actual story or words of, of the, any particular myth. It, that, in other words, does it matter uh, if we're being sticklers about what it is, what Rob described as a utilitarian document, uh, you know, fishnets, uh, versus uh, something that has become almost sacred, where the secular has become sacred. So does it really matter if we parse it historically about original intent or actual meaning or actual words? Has it become something larger than life, and does it serve a purpose in that regard? Well, so I think, in a, from the law lawyerly point of view, I think we converge um, in that uh, once one acknowledges that the Americans who invoke this are actually misinterpreting it in the same way that Moff Ferguson says, well, if English was good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't in English, you see. So, you know, whether, you know, it, 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 did, it wasn't designed for ordinary people in just the, the most basic sense of being in a language that an ordinary person at the time could understand, because ordinary people are not trained in, in Latin or Law French. Um, so, so if it's hugely important to the American narrative, um, and it's in part myth. It's very important from a loyally point of view to, to understand what the people in 1866-68 thought Magna Carta meant rather than what Magna Carta sort of actually meant if you're doing a thing called constitutional law. What the founding generation thought was meant by law of the land or judgment of peers um, or unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, rather than what it actually meant in 1215. So it, it matters whether it's historically accurate or a myth in terms of what kind of proper originalist legal history one does. Historians are grateful for your response. Kenton. Two, two main points. Um, I think really there are two myths about the Magna Carta. Uh, the first is on the ABA website that it's the foundation of individual freedom. That there's a kind of straight line. We get that line. taken down, so, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the web. It, it, <laughs> that there's a straight line. That it's that it's that history is a, a kind of a, a, a movement of paper across time by hands, all of whom are in agreement about what's happening, and 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 that's a myth. But I think also the the idea that it's an, a purely elitist document that it's confined to the barons versus the king that you really wouldn't want to take sides that both sides are dreadful. I think that's also a myth, and I think that uh, that point's been well made. You know, it's, it's a document of tremendous complexity. Um, I would recommend, uh, anybody who wants to get into this, David Carpenter's new Penguin book. It's uh, a marvelous <laughs> kind of <laughs> summary. <laughs> um, well, it's just, it just one of many current, I mean, it's obviously a period in which people are writing about the Magna Carta for obvious reasons, the 800th anniversary. Um, I want to get to my second point is this question of does it matter? Does the 13th century matter? And I would say it does. I would say that, uh, you know, when I think about my liberal arts uh, students and all the strengths and weaknesses they bring, you know, they're very uh, willing to take notes. Uh, they're, uh, you know, uh, most of them hand in original work. Uh, most of them <laughs> are willing to listen to other points of view and are willing to, you know, provide evidence, but almost all of them, even the brightest students, think of themselves as uh, existing on top of a pyramid where they're at the present and they're at the top and they get to kind of, because of when they were born, which was about 2014, um, <laughs> 2000, 1999, whatever, uh, very recently, because of where they are in history, they kind of get to look down and they get to look down you know, at Lincoln is down there and then way below is the Magna Carta and then Plato is below that. And, uh, and of course that way of thinking about our relationship to history, our sort of own historical uh, position is of course entirely misguided. The 13th century turns out to be a fantastically interesting period of English history. Sadly, none of them know that the plague is around the corner. 14th century, you know, new towns are developing all over England, new wealth, homes become warmer, uh, women are going into court, peasants are going into court, a, an, a, an enormous number of people are shifting through, often through devious means, moving themselves from the unfree to the free, which I think is absolutely crucial. The Doomsday Book uh, at 1086 
the picture we get is that the unfree constitute 85% uh, of the population. By the time of the Magna Carta, it's more like uh, 50 or 60%. Uh, you know, so, so large numbers of people are entering society, as it were. And, and in fact, uh, one of the reasons why the document uh, says so much about uh, classes below the noble class is because both the king and the nobility, and the church, of course, is a, Stephen Langton's a special question here, but particularly the church, I'm mean, sorry, the, the nobles and the, the king are trying to, in different ways, appeal to groups below where they occupy. And that uh, complex movement of kind of power and uh, coalition building is at the heart of the Magna Carta and helps explain uh, the, uh, all the ways in which uh, uh, the rights of free men is, is acknowledged as well as, in, in particular clauses, the rights of nobles. Okay, Joyce is next, then Dan. Yes, I think I'm glad that you mentioned that about the free men because within, well, by the end of the 15th century, everyone's free mm, because yeah. of the plague. So, um, so when the Magna Carta says that there are certain things that are for all free men, it turns out eventually that they, everyone is free and that pertains to everybody. Um, I, I have very few students that escape my reach without reading Magna Carta. <laughs> and uh, these law students are very surprised to find so many property rights, legal tenants actually expressed in Magna Carta. Um, so I, you know, the idea that somehow none of this is really relevant or it was all made up later isn't true. I mean, the, a lot of things obviously evolved in the way that we interpret them, but um, there are a lot of really key elements, particularly to property rights um, and judicial rights that uh, are in Magna Carta. And I'm sort of bothered by the term myth because it, it sort of smacks of something that didn't really happen. Well, well again, that's why I introduced the Campbell in, uh, uh, definition because in modern usage, myth is often a, uh, used to right. indicate a lie. Or an untruth. It made up. Or that's why what I was saying was it matters. I wasn't saying does it matter. I was saying does the notion of whether we're being accurate versus the mythical meaning matter. Uh, does it matter to get those right? In other words, if we believe it's a foundation for constitutional law or for rule of law, and it serves that purpose. Uh, what is, uh, Robert Rob wrote. It was Magna Carta that steeled the Patriots' resolve. Had not the great barons of Runnymede taken down a king, could not Americans do the same? If it right. serves that kind of purpose, right. does it matter if we're being accurate about the dotted t uh, I's or, or cross T's? Well, as a historian, I have to believe that a certain amount of it matters. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, 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 does the, but does the mythology matter more than the actual uh, clinical dissection of the document? I'm not sure that it's real mythology in the sense that, you know, I think that the roots of, of a lot of these rights and the, preserva the idea of the preservation of rights and of tying the monarch to the law. Um, and, and, and in fact, at the end of Magna Carta, he sort of promises that if by anything he does, any of these rights or these promises shall be diminished, they shall be null and void. Mm -hmm. So I think that it, um, that, the, the roots are there. Uh, you know, I don't think that we're exaggerating it. Yeah. Um, Daniel, you wanted to say something, and then Rob, you had your yeah, hand up. Yeah, a couple of points. I mean, one, as I said initially, the, the idea of constitutionalism has persisted. That is still there, and, and that's not a myth in the sense we're using that term. I think it matters to understand what the original situation was, but I think the myth is very important. You probably saw on the cover of, of our program for tonight is the 1775 <coughs> seal of the colony of Massachusetts, which shows a patriot brandishing a sword in one hand and Magna Carta in the other. The same year, Maryland issued a $4 <coughs> bill that has uh, 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 Lady Liberty trying to give a petition to Britannia and on the other side of Britannia is King George distracting her, and what is he stomping on? It says Magna Carta. I mean, this was a symbol that mattered, mm -hmm. and, and so that's very important. I, the myth, I mean, the myth is still with us in a real way. As, as William Hubbard said, the only uh, uh, memorial at Runnymede was given by the American Bar Association. That's very interesting. Um, they're building another one this year. What is it? It's 12 seats to represent trial by jury. Trial by yes. jury did not historically come from Magna Carta. That's part of the myth. 
Uh, and that's fine, that's part of the myth, it's good. But that's what the English are actually building there, is something the to, trial suits. to trial by jury. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to say is th there was part of Magna Carta that actually applied <laughs> to everyone. As you, you probably know, uh, it, it was annulled by the Pope 10 weeks after it was sealed by King John. Uh, but then it was reissued by King Henry III's regent and the Pope's legate in 1216. So 1215, the king's enemies were forcing it on King John. 1216, the king's friends, were, including the Pope who had annulled it, were reissuing it. It's a very interesting flip. In 1217, they reissued it again and they spun off the parts that dealt with the forest and, and formed the Carta de Foresta. That's when Magna Carta actually got its name because it was bigger in size than the Carta de Foresta. Um, Carta de Foresta, parts of it apply to everyone, not just to Bremen. So that movement had already started. Um, so I, I mean, there, there's a continual historical shift here. It's important to understand it, but I think in the end, the myth is what carries the day. Kensity, yes. I, uh, I want to take issue with something my colleague uh, uh, Joyce said. Um, the term property rights is so interesting in relation to Magna Carta. Uh, in part, they are talking about property rights, and, and uh, much of the focus of many of the clauses is taxation. And taxation, of course, is connected to property rights. The barons can't really enjoy their property rights if King John is just squeezing them, as had his brother Richard and their father. Um, but you know, when you think about the fish weirs or you think about the clause that has to do with um, removing barriers, access uh, that allowed people access to the river or the movement of, of uh, people along rivers, uh, really uh, it's, it's not property rights in a modern sense, it's the commons. Uh, in the 13th century, there is still, uh, unlike uh, in later uh, debates over the Magna Carta in the 17th and 18th century, this idea that you know uh, people can use the land and uh, the berries and the wood and so on, and part of what, of course, not only the Magna Carta but the Charter of the Forest does is kind of affirm these ancient liberties. Uh, so their property rights held by uh, the people, or at least the free, uh, rather than property in the sense that my neighbors and I have property rights that you know they can't do certain things in the hallway, so on and so forth. So Americans have a, 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 a version of property rights, but the Magna Carta harks back to a very different world. And of course, the, the word that I haven't yet used here is rural. Uh, London uh, consists, in about 1215, about 40,000 people live in London. Uh, the mayor is a signatory to the, the one of the 25 who uh, 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 petitioned the king. But he's unnamed uh, because the nobility, of course, have a kind of higher status than uh, the mayor of London. Uh, you know, it's hard for us even to imagine an England with a capital city of 40,000 people. Uh, so it is the product of a very different time, and that's my point, that um, I think that History makes us, uh, you know, gives us uh, things that a kind of a presentist, uh, self-centered focus can't give us, a deeper understanding of the world we live in. Rob? Uh, as an historian, I, I need to say that facts matter, uh, and, and I certainly agree with, with my colleague here that, that uh, the 13th century is actually a very interesting time, mm -hmm. and it's a very important thing to know. And I just thought one of the ways of reconciling this, and I, th I think it's a very interesting intellectual question is if we think about the 13th century and we think about Magna Carta and the things that go along with Magna Carta, we're looking at a time in which uh, they inhabit an intellectual world that we really do not understand unless we really get in and explore it. So it's, it's entirely possible in the medieval mindset, for instance, to imagine the king is both under the law and above the law at the same time. And the, the dominant metaphor they use is that the king is the father and the son of the law. Uh, and Magna Carta plays a role in this. So it plays a role in the act of creation of the idea of law as the king's bridle. By the time we get to the 18th and 19th century, it's being deployed in a very different way. And as an intellectual historian, I get to take that just as seriously as the constitutional lawyer would. We need to know what the founders thought about Magna Carta to understand why it, why it is important and how it should then be used in terms of constitutional interpretation. So I think it can fulfill both roles. Is there an agreed upon moments in history, or, or maybe you'll have different moments you would identify where 
Magna Carta starts to become legendary. I, I, in other words, it, it, was it a legend in its own time or did that take time? And can you identify a moment where it's either referenced in some significant way or when you could say the historical record indicates that this is something that has staying power. This is something that is significant in the consciousness of people attempting to self-govern. Joyce. Yes, uh, the 17th century, particularly the, uh, from the beginning of the 17th century where you have increasing tensions between the power of the crown and individual rights uh, and religious uh, dissension. Um, you have uh, Sir Edward Cook writing about Magna Carta and appealing to it. You have the Petition of Right. Um, he really elevates Magna Carta, and some feel he sort of made up a lot of things. But I think that he, um, but he really he goes back to it and sort of, you know, sort of rediscovers it. Um, and I think that that you know kind of brings out the importance of Magna Carta. And it was just at that point when the colonies are being populated and Americans colonists are sort of taking Cook's ideas about Magna Carta uh, and, and really fighting for them. see a lot of nods of agreement from your colleagues. I wonder That's if anyone nice. would, <laughs> isn't that for a little change yeah. of pace. Uh, w it, would anyone identify any other historical moments that are noteworthy in this regard? Well, I would just say that, that from the very beginning, there are references in, in, in English uh, legal documents that it was being invoked. Mm -hmm. And the Library of Congress has a, a just a wonderful little miniature uh, Magna Carta that presumably a, a judge or a sheriff traveled with, just like Justice Breyer pulled out his, his, his version of the Constitution, his pocket version. Uh, and it's on display at the Library of Congress if you're interested. Um, so since we're talking about the Constitution now, yeah. Showbiz is all about props. Yeah, I'll tell you. Little, little, little books. So, there's another one for you if you want, right here. Oh, well, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, then everyone so, should have one. <laughs> um, there are some continuities, but I also really want you to understand important differences. And I want you to understand how, um, not just for Magna Carta, but for our own constitutional tradition, we have missed time, certain things, in the same way that we're um, many people misattribute um, the origins of jury trial to Magna mm. Carta. Okay, so here's some, we do the same thing. Almost everything that you, that much of what people think is really the Bill of Rights isn't the Bill of Rights, it's the 14th Amendment. It's Lincoln's generation. Indeed, even the phrase Bill of Rights, which is not used in the Constitution, but was very prominently used by the generation that gave us, Lincoln's generation, the 14th Amendment. So Magna Carta, yes. But here's what I meant in part by not so much. So immediately after this shot heard round the world, um, in April of 1775, 140 years ago, um, we, we get independence of 13 colonies um, from uh, the mother country. And in none of these colonies, um, is there a House of Lords mm -hmm. um, or a hereditary monarch? Okay, so now consent of the governed, maybe we can trace roots to Magna Carta, but it's a very different kind of thing when we don't have, when we've repudiated the hereditary principle, the radicalism of the American Revolution, to borrow a phrase from the great historian Gordon Wood. Now, one problem, of course, is slavery, um, which is a kind of um, a remnant, a relic of this um, ancien regime uh, based on birth and blood rather than um, um, the really the, the, the real idea that, well, if we're all created equal at birth, people aren't, shouldn't be born kings or noblemen or, or serfs or free or slave. You know, we should be equal whether we're born black or white or male or female or Jew or Gentile or, I dare say, gay or straight. Um, and Jefferson says this, and um, uh, Lincoln repeats it at Gettysburg, which you heard Justice Breyer mention. Uh, that's the proposition. But for Lincoln, it means, again, something very different, because Lincoln's generation is going to put that word equal in the 14th Amendment, which Justice Breyer also mentioned. And now it really is going to mean, after a 13th, ain't no more slavery anymore. Now we really... And this is a very, so, so these are huge things in the history of the world because they, they still have a, ki a queen, you know, and who voted for her, okay? So, and, and we don't, and 
if this is the American Bar Association, I do want you to understand the deep foundations of our principles. Yes, there are roots, but there are also revolutionary breaks. Uh, 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 that, and we celebrate anniversaries of those too, 1775 and 1865 are huge revolutionary breaks, even though one can also see the roots. Are they, would you, they're evolutionary breaks, not evolutionary steps. Revolutionary. Revolutionary breaks, breaks not evolutionary steps, right? Is that the? Yes, okay. uh, getting rid of uh, you know, immediate, um, uncompensated, universal emancipation is a pretty no. dramatic shift. Not, not, a you know, not just Joe, a Joe Biden would call it a BFD. Not a slight edit, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Can't say. There, there is an odd sense in which, though, the Constitution is and they're invoking Magna Carta as they're doing all this, and they're, <laughs> you know, reinterpreting. That's why I asked the question way. about the mythology versus any uh, accurate dissection. Um, uh, I, I don't normally teach constitutional law. I uh, ended up teaching it when a colleague had a, a horrible uh, cycling accident, and it was a, a senior seminar, and so they, they needed a full-time faculty member to take it over. And I saw his notes. I read or skimmed many of the sort of standard texts and was struck by how much at the undergraduate level, the teaching of the Constitution is the teaching of the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment, and that the kind of structure of the political system was sort of brushed over. Um, and, um, you know, so we spent probably more time on the Senate uh, when I uh, taught this course than my colleague had in 20 years of teaching the class. And in a way, the organization of the Senate, the, the way in which power is apportioned for this sort of crucial institution, right? It's the only upper chamber in the world in any liberal democracy that has a kind of co-equal power to the lower chamber on all matters of policy or legislation. Um, and of course, the, the Senate is built on this principle not of individual representation, but on the idea that sort of a state a Delaware, a uh, Pennsylvania matters in the same way that the Magna Carta starts with the idea that the church or London or the merchant matters. It's a kind of corporate medieval relic almost. So corporatism but no hereditary right, basis. Right, right. So that's but remember, the revolutionary break, no property basis. That after, just quickly, just after that, just how much the country has moved in the direction of some very large states and some very small states. Uh, much greater disparity in population sizes now than was the case at the founding. Uh, Bill Maher tells this joke where he says more people shop at his Costco than vote in Wyoming. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, so, you know, I think that uh, we have myths about our own political system uh, independent of kind of the historical myths surrounding uh, the Magna Carta and one of them has to do with uh, the relationship of the individual to power as explained by or as um, kind of laid out by the Constitution. Da oh, Daniel had a his okay. it, dibs first ahead. then we'll go to you Joyce. No, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of change the focus a little bit because we're talking about the United States which of course is appropriate but it's important to think about the rest of the world too and um, in the same enclosure that the ABA memorial at Runnymede is is also a plaque on the ground which most people don't see um, uh, that was put there when the Indian Prime Minister visited. Uh, so it's important to remember this, this affected at least the Commonwealth and some other countries. In the way over here in Uber, I asked my taxi driver who was uh, from Ethiopia if he knew what Magna Carta was and there was this silence and then he said, well, you, you mean that 1215 <laughs> uh, thing, <laughs> thing in England? I mean, he knew the date. Wow. And I said, yeah, what does it mean to you? And he said, well, it means that, that uh, the, king, the king is under the law. He said, we had something like that in the 16th century, and then he apologized twice for not being able to remember the name of it. Wow. I'm impressed. He, I said, okay. where did you learn that? And he's, I said, are you a lawyer? <laughs> no, <she's not. laughs> uh, and, and he said, uh, he, he said, no, I'm not a lawyer. I learned it in high school in Addis Ababa. Wow. So I mean, I, there's a reach to this. Uh, that, that's really impressive. Oh, I, want, I want to come back to that. But Joyce, you had something to say first. Yeah, I I, uh, on uh, Akil's uh, revolutionary break. I think one of the things that we overlook uh, sometimes and which is the reason why Magna Carta is more important here than it is in Britain is that one of the things that, that we changed was that our legislature cannot 
remake the Constitution right. with a single vote. Uh, we don't have a sovereign legislature. Right. We have a Constitution that's extremely hard to amend. Right. And so, uh, whereas the, you know Britain has gotten so far away <laughs> from Magna Carta and, and its lists of rights, um, it's very it's a, a different story here. And, and the founders did not allow that kind of um, sovereignty in the legislature. That would mean that you know, with a simple majority vote, that they could make a change in the Constitution. And based in part on their interpretation of my Lord Cook, whom you invoked yes. earlier, and it's here, here uh, in your Magna Carta is such a fellow he will have no sovereign. So, yes. so Cook is not necessarily championing what will emerge later on right. in the um, the um, uh, English um, uh, Civil uh, with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the English Bill of Rights and and, right. and and the Glorious Revolution of parliamentary sovereignty. He is maybe still harking back t to an idea, perhaps that all government could be under law. There is no such thing as a sovereign uh, over the law, or maybe he's under and over at the same time, or something, a father and a son, or something like that. But, so they're interpreting Cook in a certain way, but, but that's not how English history goes. English no. history, um, with the Glorious Revolution, very much celebrates parliamentary sovereignty, right. and that's not the American tradition. That's right. So I, there's a real division there. It's a pretty stark. I want to uh, uh, dig a little deeper into the point made by Dan's uh, cab driver. <laughs> and about and ab uh, seriously, Uber, about driver. Uber, Uber driver, Uber driver, uh, about uh, you know wh if if we're talking about a document that is iconic or mythical or whatever right. uh, term we choose to describe it in, uh, where, and w in other words, you've made some points, Joyce, about it being more vibrant, the legacy more vibrant here in the United yeah. States than it is in the land of its birth. Right. But if you could give us some thoughts, if all of you could share some thoughts on how far and wide and deep this influence goes. Uh, and is, is America the place that most lionizes or, or, or yes, Kenton? I uh, spent a couple of weeks in India a few years ago, the world's largest democracy, of course, and uh, stayed at a small hotel that delivered the Times of India, which uh, is aimed at an audience of about five million Indians whose first language is English. It's not aimed at a kind of traveler audience. It's not the Herald Tribune of, of, of India. And it was uh, quite astonishing that the uh, Magna Carta was mentioned on the, in the eight days that I read the Times of India more often than any American was mentioned. In fact, there were several days where the United States did not go mentioned once, and then that, car that, that was broken, that, that, um, uh, that the United States showed up because there was an article about how Bill Clinton had lost weight. <laughs> So, and, <laughs> so that, um, you know, we forget, of course, that 38% of the world lives in India and China, 39%. And, uh, you know, I can't at all speak about uh, China, but I know in India that a kind of a middle class, an upper middle class, uh, invokes the Magna Carta probably more than the English do. Although I will say that there's a good chance that in our lifetime that will change because, of course, English or British politics is changing so dramatically, and we're seeing that this is the last uh, week of their general election, uh, the astonishing transformation of Scottish politics, the transformation of a two-and-a-half party system to a genuine multi-party system. I think there's a good bet that lots of people in England and Britain are going to be thinking about kind of deep constitutional questions, and that's going to inevitably take them to this kind of 13th century conversation, you know, these issues that we're talking about because they're going to have to rethink questions of, you know, what does a Scottish nationalist member of parliament have to say about English questions that are unique to, say, England or Wales, and, uh, you know, how do we justify um, sort of fundamental aspects of our political system? And so I think that, you know, famously the English are sort of indifferent to theory. It's the French who care about theory, but I think that political events uh, in Britain are going to push these constitutional questions back onto the table. So um, the lawyers in the crowd may recall that there were two judges. They were related, um, last name Hand, and the admin uh, and the advice basically given um, was to quote learned but follow Gus. Um, and, the, <laughs> and the Indians might quote Magna Carta, but in the deepest sense, you see, they're following the United States. They have a, a written constitution. Uh, 
and they have judicial review of the acts of the legislature, which if, Engl if Britain has it, it has it only very, very recently and following the Americans. And, not, and, and, and my Lord Cook would be very happy with all this, so maybe this was a, a bank shot from Magna Carta to Cook to America putting the entire government and the legislature, our parliament under law, maybe now back to England or something, but it's, it's not a sort of a straight shot through no. the, the British tradition. So, so the, the Indians in the deepest way, you see, I think really are American. <laughs> <laughs> Dan and then Rob. Well, well, let, let Rob go first. Uh, Rob go first, okay. Well, uh, that's interesting though because uh, of course what that means is that we're <laughs> under the courts, right? And this and is. We have Steve Breyer launch, you know, launching our conversation. I've, and I've had a. Uh, uh, this has been, been part of the scholarship I've worked on, which uh, actually looks at 19th century cases in which the, the people sometimes did what the court said and sometimes did not <laughs> do what the court said. Uh, and actually involved a, a state court that invalidated the Fugitive Slave Act, you know, and exercised it in the strongest of ways. But in a kind of. Yes, in Abelman v. Booth, right. Uh, but the, the, the reason I, I just want to make a small intervention there, and we, we might want to remember here for a second that we, one thing we haven't talked about is political violence. We have not talked about political violence. And Magna Carta, we must remember, was a failure. The Founders Constitution was a failure. I wrote that myself. I'm just kidding. I, I stole that. Uh, <laughs> apparently, you don't remember. You're looking at me blank. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, that's it. I thought that I, no, I agree he, with that line. He's texted his lawyer. He remembers. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it's true. A and, failure and called the Civil War, uh -huh. you know, yeah. which is why 150 years ago, when we put it together, that's actually an important anniversary, too, for us mm -hmm. to recall. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lincoln, you know, this city, this month, 150 years ago. These, and, and, and I, I, I say that provocatively, but I say it because we have to remember that the specter of political violence mm -hmm. always looms. And the point of any constitution, the point of Magna Carta, which really we ought to think of in a way as a peace treaty between the barons and the mm -hmm. king, mm -hmm. is meant to stop political violence. Mm -hmm. And that's the grand riddle. That's really a grand riddle that we, we have not broached yet because we're kind of dazzled by the, by the phrases in Magna Carta about personal liberty or about the fish weirs. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I am anyway. But really, it's, it's, about, it's about the yeah. violence. Dan, did you want to say, uh, Joyce, I know you're, you're next too, but you had well, passed off to Rob. Did you just make the point that, that the U.S., of course, doesn't really follow these ideals either. In, I have a prop too, which is my book <laughs> on Magna Carta, which does use the term rule of law because I'm less imaginative perhaps, but I do think that rule of law is at the, found, is at the basis of it. But mm -hmm. uh, one of the chapters there is by Judge Diane Wood, who's the Chief Judge of the Seventh Circuit. And, and she argues that the, the, the doctrines of sovereign immunity in the United States, which of course excuse the governments, you know, tribal governments, local governments, state governments, federal governments, from being accountable uh, to the people. And she says, uh, first she points out that there's a little discrepancy there between the ideals we're talking about and the myth um, of Magna Carta, but also she says it's based on a, on a misunderstanding of English law, so she thinks actually uh, we could we could revise that mm -hmm. and revisit it now. Mm -hmm. sure. so, uh, Magna Carta did try it, uh, its final clause to prevent, or uh, I should say, arrange for political violence to be <laughs> controlled in a very odd way, where if the if the king was violating Magna Carta, there was this watchdog group of twenty five barons who would listen to petitions about his, and if the king still refused to comply. They had the right, he gave them the right to actually rebel against him and take all his property so long as they did not hurt him and his family. <laughs> and so obviously this was you know, it's sort of a right of, of revolution or rebellion. Authorize a bloodless coup? Yes, to authorize, well, to, they couldn't, <laughs> ups, not, you know, not a real coup, just to take away everything from him to, so that he would be constrained to actually abide by Magna Carta. Um, so it, it did make that you know, effort. Although the attached to that was something that I think had far more resonance of, or lasting power, and that is that he says that if he does anything against Magna Carta or infringes on it, um, that this sh will never be um, that it will be null and void and will never be used as a precedent. But the, the watchdog group I, I find very charming that you could actually rebel and 
That would be fine with him as long as you don't hurt him. Uh, Kenton wants to say something, but I want to cue you too that we are going to, after we hear from him, turn to your questions and comments. And so where are our, our friends with the microphones here? Okay, if you'll take positions down here by the front so you can see as well as I can who's raising their hands. But uh, first is going to be the gentleman. Is that Jan? I don't have my glasses on. Jan Kalitschi. Okay, he'll be first, and then we'll find somebody, if you could find somebody on your side of the audience as well. But Kenton, go ahead, please. There's a great deal in, that's in the Magna Carta, whether you look at the 1215 version or the version that finally ends up in statutory law in 1297. There's a great deal of the text that you can trace back, particularly to the coronation uh, of uh, Henry I, 1100. Uh, but the security clause, which Joyce just referred to, is uh, conspicuously absent in English law. There really is no obvious um, uh, you know, antecedent, and um, uh, it's the, by far, in a way, the most radical of the early Magna Carta, and I think uh, fascinating uh, how it is that um, uh, church leaders and nobles concocted a system where 25 men of the realm tenants-in-chief could, uh, in effect, uh, kind of push the nuclear button, right, uh, and <laughs> seize the castles of the king. At this point, uh, if memory serves, King John either controls or, or, or uh, has um, near control over a third of the castles of the land, and two-thirds are in the hands of the nobility. Um, and so there's, a, there's an already pre-given delicate balance between the king and the most powerful families. That's, that's not a problem that King John creates. It's a problem his behavior exacerbates. But this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, Neustadt, was it Neustadt who talked about the president in tennis shoes? Well, the, you know, the early English, the Anglo-Norman kings are wearing tennis shoes as they deal with these different power centers, these castles, these, these barons, these families. Uh, and the security clause, the final or, or penultimate clause of the Magna, original Magna Carta, gives these 25 men extraordinary power over the monarch. And I think it's, it's that clause in particular that most, um, I don't know whether it's annoys or terrifies. I don't really know enough about Pope Innocent, but I know that the papacy uh, is, is uh, struck by uh, some of the claims, but, but really perhaps terrified by the idea that uh, other nobles across continental Europe would begin to emulate the British example. I just want to say one other thing. Sure. My own favorite clause is not fishing weirs, although I, I think that access to rivers is not a uh, minor issue for rural people. But uh, my favorite clause is uh, that widows cannot be forced to remarry. Imagine a world. <laughs> and, and you know, the reason why that's in there is because the king makes profit from arranging these marriages of noble widows and uh, various families, not only in England, but, but to cement alliances with Scotland and, and Wales and, and uh, Normandy and so on. And, uh, you know, my students find it hard to imagine a world in which you need to declare that as a right, yeah. uh, that you cannot force a widow to remarry. But there is something, I mean, as, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues are right that it's myth, that there's not as strong a connection between U.S. and English law, legal history as, as we might imagine. But, but just the idea that there are basic things that we should take for granted and, and, that, and that some of them we've now thankfully moved so far that we don't even have to articulate them, I think is just a beautiful thing. Is there, and I, and I know we're, we queued up the audience questions so I don't want to trigger a huge response, but y your, your comment just now makes me think, is there also significance that this is a written document? Absolutely. That, well, y we know for a fact that within 50 or 60 years, people who are not literate, who do not have access to the original texts, the various emendations, uh, are uh, themselves citing the language of the uh, Magna Carta. We know that in particular, those uh, um, villages where people say that they are members of a kingdom, where they enjoy certain common liberties, uh, they're particularly clustered in the East Midlands, and uh, if you go to the Doomsday Book, it seems clear that the East Midlands has the greatest percentage of free men. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you know, the rules of the game simple, just uh, introduce yourself, and it's always helpful if you can direct your question to a particular panelist, but don't worry about that. If you can't, we'll sort it out. Jan Kulitschke from the Wilson Center. Let me compliment the panel.
panel. This is a fantastic experience. Uh, I heard the mention of individual rights once in the whole conversation. And flipping through the pamphlet, I see multiple references to habeas corpus. Uh, could you tell us whether individual rights mattered more in the mythology of Magna Carta over time than it did at the beginning? Or were individual rights in the minds of the people at the beginning, but it just applied to a smaller number? These uh, chapters deals with a particular problem. There are bankruptcy, there's a chapter on bankruptcy, there's one on traveling abroad. Uh, they didn't think in terms of individual rights, I'm sure. Uh, habeas corpus, the first recorded instance, I think, was in 1199. It was used to bring people into court. It didn't have the same meaning that we have now. Uh, so, and its, its meaning has been uh, modified vastly over time. In, in antebellum South, it was used to determine who owned slaves. I mean, it's very different than what we care about as, <coughs> as, as habeas. So, uh, I don't think individual rights was the concept, but there were individual problems, like the widow situation, or people inheriting, um, or access to, to the river. That, that there were individuals who wanted to do that, and, and, but they didn't think in terms of rights, I believe. <coughs> I think they thought more in terms of liberties, franchises. Okay. Everything was in the plural, in the medieval mind, and they didn't think abstractly about freedom of speech, or some kind, it's the way we think about rights today. Mm -hmm. Joyce, go ahead. But it, it was an individual right in the sense that the king could not come and seize your property, that you had a right to um, be heard by your peers, or the, um, even, um, you know, the widows being able to marry, all mm -hmm. of those sort of have an I individual resonance to them. And, so. sin mm -hmm. oh, and since you mentioned freedom of speech, just to give you an example of how there are continuities and differences, um, the English Bill of Rights of 1689 is not the first document, but it very um, uh, famously proclaims freedom of speech and debate, but that's in Parliament, right. from yeah. French parler, to speak. Yeah. Uh, 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 Parliament is a place where the people speak, parley, if uh, you're a, um, a, a Pirates of the Caribbean fan or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a certain kind of speech, it's political discourse, it's not commercial advertising, and it's in Parliament, and Americans generalize that because right. in America we, the people, are parliament. Uh, we are sovereign, um, not um, uh, government. Um, and so um, similarities and important differences uh, between the American uh, understanding and English roots and precursors. Catholic press. I think it has to be said that uh, it's, all, it's really because of two clauses that we really remember the Magna Carta and that so many people say in the 19th century invoked it in the United States. And that's uh, the clauses that are of most interest to the ABA, clauses 39 and 40. Yeah. They happen to be some of the most succinct clauses. And there's a wonderful kind of laxness of the language, you know, where they may well have been speaking about a much more narrow group of people than the language allows. And so you could see why within a generation or a couple of generations, people would begin to say, wait a minute, that applies to me as well. Ch uh, Article 39, no free man is to be arrested or imprisoned, blah, 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 save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. And then number 40, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. Mm -hmm. um, it's because of those two sentences that we're here today. Okay, who's next? Who else has a question or comment? Anybody? No one else? You're going to leave it to me? Yes, sir. Okay. My name is <coughs> Stephen Shore. My question is more on the developments on the other side of the pond, where the monarchy continues. It's still said uh, to be the most powerful monarchy in, in Europe, and it arguably is, with the weekly conferences between the monarch and the prime minister. And although two medieval kings <laughs> were deposed, one was ex died in battle, uh, King Charles was overthrown, a 11-year republic, and then the Glorious Revolution, where a group of Englishmen, not unlike the 25 mentioned, invites a foreign monarch to overthrow King James. And uh, the, yet the monarchy endures, even though, uh, and it was we, one of the, the myths of the declaration is that King George did all this nasty stuff when George was, as he himself would have recognized, entirely a creature of parliament. So my question is, how could, on one side of the pond, 
Magna Carta to become a charter of enduring monarchy, whereas on this side it's uh, it, um, repeatedly cited as the basis of American republicanism. Go ahead, Joyce. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll take that on. Again. Um, actually, uh, George the Third um, wasn't completely a, crea uh, a creature of Parliament, but Parliament does become more and more powerful. So you have a monarch, but who's a nice symbol of the state above politics, uh, you know, uniting the country. Um, but the the Queen's speech every year is written for her by the party in power. So her speech is just their agenda for the year. I mean, she really is just sort of a spokeswoman for the majority party in Parliament. So, um, you know, whereas here um, we have the people really do have some uh, more control over uh, uh, the legislature and the president, um, and uh, and we don't have that kind of figurehead. Sometimes I think it would be kind of nice to have a figurehead who was above, <laughs> above the fray, who would represent the country. Um, but we really have gone in very different directions. And they, they really feel in Britain that um, Parliament represents the people. This is the democratic branch. And you know, they should have complete power uh, to remake things as they wish. I mean, one j example, just briefly, is that you know, several years ago, Tony Blair at a, um, a news, you know, the, the normal news conference at nine o'clock or whatever, announced that they were going to have a, a Supreme Court. You know, they hadn't voted on it. It was just, you know, <laughs> uh, and I happened to be in Scotland with some relatives at that point, and you know, I was astonished. They're going to have a Supreme Court on the American model. Wow, you know, instead of just uh, their. A highest court being a, a is it your notion that it, your notion that it might be nice to have a, a figurehead. It, are you assuming the figurehead would have a higher approval rating than the president? <laughs> probably, I think. <laughs> I mean, the queen probably. You know, it's sort of above politics. But I was just going to say that you know, here's the prime minister radically changing the constitution um, and announcing it. You know, on the evening news. And when I expressed you know amazement, kind of delight that they were finally. They finally saw the light. This was a good idea. Um, my relatives said, "Oh, there he goes again. You know, it's just Blair." <laughs> so, um, but you know, they—it's it, just gone so far that they can just, you know, do that without, you know, another thought. Hey, Rob and Akil and Kenton here. Uh, just very quickly, the, I think there's a, actually a, a fairly simple answer to that question, and that's that uh, American understanding of sovereignty. Uh, diverges from the British understanding of sovereignty in the 18th century, yeah. and ideas of the ancient constitution are invoked in the 1760s, 1770s in ways that make no sense to the British. Uh, and it's because the Americans do not seem to gather the idea that you cannot divide power. <laughs> power is indivisible, it's absolute, or else it's not power. Mm -hmm. And of course we divide power, so there's, there's a change there. Yeah. But one thing I'll mention really quickly about Magna Carta, and then I'll stop, is that I, I said earlier that during the embargo crisis, during the War of 1812, Missouri crisis, all of these things where they're citing Magna Carta, they are cited on both sides. Mm. Mm. Magna Carta is invoked repeatedly. It's invoked as metaphor. Mm. It's not invoked because it is a specific authority that leads you to a result. It's invoked as metaphor. And it's a rich metaphorical world that Magna Carta inhabits there. So I, I, I'm glad, Steve, that you picked up on um, uh, I, uh, this, uh, the English monarch. I, I keep yeah. bringing up Queen Elizabeth um, in, in, in rude ways, but y you know, <laughs> is in, in, uh, in the lifetime of some of the people here, you see the, the English monarchy played an important role in World War II, and if it had been the wrong monarch, you know, think of where we would right. have, have been, the King's Speech and, and all of that. So, um, conventionally, um, we, um, many um, um, uh, students in AP history or AP government learn that um, uh, Tom Paine's very famous pamphlet, um, the beginning of 1776, Common Sense, really um, turns Americans away from, not just uh, uh, toward the idea of repudiation of monarchy as, um, as a whole and not just specific things that this one monarch has done mm -hmm. wrong with Parliament or on, on his own. Um, and the radicalism of the American Revolution is the complete repudiation of the hereditary principle. I want to read you what Tench Cox says about the Constitution in this regard. 
Um, he says, quote, Britain's king, quote, is hereditary and may be an idiot, a knave, or a tyrant by nature, but America's president cannot be an idiot and probably not a knave or tyrant, for those whom nature makes so reveal it before the age of 35, <laughs> until which period she cannot be um, elected. And 35, who would have had, you need to understand that's an anti-hereditary, anti-dynastic idea. George Washington becomes father of his country because he's not father of his own children. You can trust him. He's not going to try to create a throne because he's got no one to give it to. Who could get elected at the age of 31? Who would have the name recognition? Only the famous son of a famous father, you know, maybe with a middle initial of Q or W or, or <laughs> Jeb or what have you. Um, and, and you need to understand that when they're adopting this rule of 35, who is the Prime Minister of England? His name is William Pitt the Younger. Same first name, same last name as in Q and W as his daddy. And he's a member of parliament at age 21, and he's prime minister at age 24, and he might be good and he might be bad, but he's getting it because of his first and last name. So, so even in the details of our Constitution, like 35, there's a profound repudiation of the hereditary principle. There are two clauses with antecedents, even the Articles of Confederation, prohibiting titles of nobility, both at the state and the federal level, before there's even a general bill of rights against the states. We're saying states should not have um, t uh, titles of nobility. Now, of course, we do have all of this, alas, um, in, of a sort in slavery, where some people are born um, um, lords and others are born serfs, and that's why, again, I keep coming back to Mr. Lincoln and 150 years ago when we really complete um, the American Revolution, it seems to me. I would be in the camp of those who say that Queen Elizabeth plays more of a political role than we recognize, that um, if she didn't, then we wouldn't have so much testimony from Thatcher government, uh, cabinet officers, and Mrs. Thatcher herself about the anxiety that uh, the Thatcher wing of the Conservative Party felt <coughs> in terms of the monarchy and the very subtle support that the monarchy was giving not only to um, the, the more moderate or wet uh, faction of the Conservative Party, but to uh, uh, the Labor Party as well. There's this marvelous story uh, from The Guardian, a, a reported story uh, from a few years back where um, uh, a uh, coal miner from South Wales was being given a OBE or one of the honors on Honors Day. And he had just been uh, knighted with the, with the actual sword on his shoulders. And afterwards, uh, there's a party for all the people who get uh, um, the on Honors Day. And um, he's saying to the queen, uh, well, you know, I'm labor, and uh, you know, I don't expect you, mom, marm, to, um, to understand. And she says, no, we love old labor. And uh, that's a kind of political uh, statement from somebody who uh, we think of as kind of ceremonial or, or there to promote tourism. The fascinating thing about the British monarchy is what happens after such a gifted occupant leaves the scene, you know, because I think we're looking at the most successful monarch in, you know, modern times. Uh, Queen Victoria is the only conceivable rival. You have to go way before to find uh, other figures, Queen Elizabeth I. Um, fascinating that it's women. It's very hard to imagine that uh, her son or grandson will be able to play this kind of unifying, moderating, uh, adult role while seeming to be above politics. And the moment a monarch slips and fails to uh, perform those duties with the degree of sensitivity that the current monarch has, I think the monarchy itself faces a crisis. Got time for, I'm just going to ask uh, for a quick final thought from each of you around a, a question that may appear that I'm uh, seeking validation on behalf of the ABA, but I'm not. And the question is, what's the most important reason, the single most important reason to gather together to commemorate an 800-year-old document? And please challenge the premise just to prove that I'm not looking for validation. If you don't think that it's an important thing to do, tell us that as well. But just uh, your thought on that. Akil? Um, I guess tradition, uh, but as you heard uh, earlier this week in oral argument, a tradition is distinctly a double-edged sword. I, I tend to prefer equality over tradition. 
Uh, and that's why I wish, actually, uh, we were instead commemorating the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's passing. I think we have, with your help. In a <laughs> yeah, <way>. right. <laughs> Rob. I think, it's, I think it is important for us to do two things, and one is to, to think about the real history, the history that we, we, uh, we discover about something like Magna Carta, to understand what it really was. Uh, and we've had a lot of people talk about that today. It's a, very, it's a very interesting thing. I think it's also important that we get together to commemorate, to tell stories to each other. I think it was very important to hear, the, hear again the story about what Little Rock meant, to understand that stories have multiple meanings, that they help define who we are, and that by, by the act of storytelling, by the act of, of understanding our history and understanding ourselves historically, we come to affirm values, and those values can help hold us together. Dan. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to think and talk about the rule of law and to educate about it. Uh, ten years ago, we were torturing people, and very, very few people in this country objected. It violated our domestic law, it violated international law, and we were quiet. And we need to think about rule of law. And this, the focus, the spotlight from Magna Carta, uh, it really allows us to do that. And I know that's been a part of the ABA's thinking. Uh, Joyce. I think it's important. Um, I'd like to just read you, if I could, a, a short paragraph from the Federal Farmer that was written during the debates over the Constitution. And he's talking about <coughs> how freedom depends on keeping in view this legacy of Magna Carta. He says that the people might not forget those rights and gradually become prepared for arbitrary government. Their discerning and honest leaders cause this instrument, talking about Magna Carta, to be confirmed near 40 times and to be read twice a year in public places, not that it would lose its vitality without such confirmation, but to fix the content of it in the minds of the people as they successively come upon the stage. Men in some countries do not remain free merely because they are entitled to natural and inalienable rights. Men in all countries are entitled to them, not because their ancestors once got together and enumerated them on paper, but because by repeated negotiations and declarations, <coughs> all parties are brought to realize them and, of course, to believe them to be sacred. Then he, might, he says, I might show the wisdom of our past conduct as a people in not <coughs> merely confining comforting ourselves that we were entitled to freedom, but in constantly keeping in view, in view in addresses and bills of rights and newspapers and the particular principles on which our freedom must always depend. I think it's really important to recur to first principles and remind ourselves what they are. Okay, and Professor Worcester with a W, thanks to uh, the arbitrary ruling of uh, uh, alphabetical seating, you get the point. <laughs> the, the real power. That's a tradition. Power. Right. <laughs> uh, one I have suffered under um, <laughs> as a W. Um, I think, um, you know, I think of the, uh, the small peasant village in uh, uh, early in the 14th century. Michael Wood has a chapter about this in his lovely book, In Search of England. Uh, where he describes uh, very humble people who are approached by sheriffs. Um, they are being taxed. They don't think that tax is lawful. Uh, the sheriff sees some of the men, and the women apparently come out and start berating them. And um, this is in the middle of the country, in the East Midlands again. And uh, the sheriffs say, you know, uh, we can't even understand how you think you have a right to object. And they say, we're members of the community of the realm which is, you know, uh, the language of the MC. And uh, so these men are taken to London, and the courts hear it. Of course, we have this because uh, actually the 13th century is when the English begin to really record mm -hmm. uh, their government and their legal processes. And um, uh, the courts finally rule that uh, indeed the commoners were right, that the sheriffs were exceeding their powers. And so uh, there's a kind of somewhat bitter critique of this kind of discussion, 800 years. It's a kind of conservative thing. Um, you know, we should be focusing on the modern world. We should be focusing on equality. And it's, it's, it's absolutely the, the case. But on the other hand, the Magna Carta is not only something that we talk about in order to congratulate ourselves for being on top of the pyramid of history, but the Magna Carta was also a weapon that ordinary people used against uh, people who 
assumed they had power to not only lock them up, not only take their property, but also, uh, Daniel's point, to torture them. Mm -hmm. Before we, we bring William Hubbard up here to close things out, I just wanted to say, do you remember at the beginning of this panel discussion, I, I said, I complimented the ABA on their ability to assemble amazing panels. Well, now you got to experience it, and I would like to thank the panel for a dazzling display of knowledge and of uh, <laughs> critical and challenging thinking. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, thanks. And welcome back our presiding officer, the president of the ABA, William Hubbard. John, thank you very much. Uh, we do know, despite these mythical qualities, that Chief Justice Roberts cited Magna Carta yesterday in the Yulee case, upholding the right of Florida to regulate the ability of judges to solicit funds for their reelection. So <laughs> despite some mythical aspects, it's still very right. much uh, a part of the constitutional law of the United States. And Kenton, um, I hear you on that sealing date, the four days later, and I often wondered <laughs> if the king knew he was going to go ahead and, and seal it there at Runnymede and whether he had his contraption with him so he could get <laughs> it done and how quickly people could, could do the writing on the parchment. But I'm not going to call 1,200 American lawyers and their guests who are going to be at <laughs> Runnymede <laughs> on June 15, uh, 2015, along with another four or 5,000 other people and the royal family to celebrate the sealing of Magna Carta. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to pay for those change fees on the airlines, <laughs> but they'll have to stay an extra four days. Uh, thanks again to the uh, Wilson Center for uh, an absolutely splendid venue and for all your support. Uh, these are certainly important concepts, and um, Magna Carta, mythical or not, it's certainly a part of our life today. And the panelists certainly have enlivened it and, and brought it to life for us, and let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Yeah. Yeah.